Hello, everyone, and welcome to Grip Locks, Foundation Disc Golf's weekly podcast. I'm Hunter, joined as always by Trevor. And except not always. Except for not always, because <laughs> next week Trevor's leaving us forever. Uh, not don't really, say no. That. No, don't, please. Um, no, he's not leaving <laughs> us. He's just, uh, he's going on his honeymoon next week, and he will not be here. And also, it makes sense as to why he will not be Skyping in. Uh, so, we will have a guest host next week. Um, I'll let you wait until next week to figure out who that is. Uh, also, we're in a new studio. You might not have seen our... Move to Los Angeles. Yeah. You might not have seen the Foundation follow-up, which is our like live stream uh, show audio. Again, I think I said this literally the last time we are in the new studio. Uh, this shouldn't make that big of a difference for audio listeners, but if you're a YouTube person that you like watching, uh, it's pretty sick. Uh, we will post a picture on Instagram so that... If you're listening on audio and you want to check out what our new studio looks like, head over there to our Instagram at Foundation Disc Golf, and you can check out the post um, and kind of see what you're see where we make what you're listening to. Mm-hmm. That one came out right. Perfect. Uh, also, before we start, we're about to get into Jonesboro news and stuff like that. You might see this coffee in front of me. That is because I won the dark horse pick, courtesy of Sam. Uh, I played with him at Clemson. I was very confident in him. And he did it for me. So this is a nice horchata courtesy of Trevor. Once again, Connor got ahead in the uh, game due to the uh, ratings yeah. default. Which That's how he won last week. This yeah. week it's how he which came Which is fair place. game. Not a complaint. Fair game. You choose a lower rated player, you get that yeah. opportunity. But Connor and I, our players tied, but he had the lower rated player. So he came in second. This is about the most expensive drink I could get without going over the limit. What was the limit? Five bucks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What was it at? It was a little over four. Yeah, there we go. And then Con- I tipped a guy. Connor just kind of disappeared, but he's back. <laughs> really confused me. Let's get into Jonesboro, though. Enough enough joking around. There was a lot of stuff that went down at Jonesboro. Super interesting tournament. Um, did not shake down really how we expected in a lot of ways, but the results, Ricky was able to take it down by four strokes over Calvin Heimberg. I mean, did it not, though? Eagle McMahon came in third. I was more thinking an FPO. And then okay. I went to MPO. Okay. But, um, <laughs> okay, I was like, it was two out of the three. Right. Ricky, though, is having himself a year right now. Ricky might be impossible to beat. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think one thing that's – I've seen this online. People have been talking about Ricky having himself a great season. Mm-hmm. And people are like, well, is he really, though? He has three wins. Well, one's a national tour, one's a pro tour, and one's a pro tour silver series, his three wins. And then I think he has like a fifth place and an 11th place outside of that. But the thing we have to remember is a dominant season nowadays looks so much different because the field is so much better. Well, yeah, and how many has he won? Like three out of four? Like, like what? three out of five? I'm pretty sure. I'm saying it's like well, I'm saying like on a current streak. Like, I, it's, oh, the current streak's three out of four. Yeah, that's what he I'm saying. It's kind of like, is it first, first, fifth, first, or first, fifth, first, first? I don't know. But One like of those the, two. the current event is that Ricky is unbeatable. Like, yeah, maybe a few events from now he won't be on the hot streak he's on right now. But like as of now, Ricky is like on a streak where he looks really good yeah i mean i think right now it's pretty hard to i don't know argue for someone else not being the number yeah. one player in the world I don't right know now if anybody can beat him right now uh i think the the closest person to ricky this year so far calvin. is calvin heimberg calvin calvin is literally captain second place and like he's obviously capable of winning i'm not saying that i'm not like not like i've said about eagle before i'm like eagle's so good but he can't win calvin calvin is a player who can win and could probably win a lot but he just like is so good at coming in second place, it seems like, because he's, he's like so the, consistent. He's like the Katrina Allen of the MPO field. Yeah, kind of. Like, he's just so consistent. He's always where, like, there. Unless somebody somebody has to go off to beat him each week, but then even, even like, on the weeks where they that does happen, he's just always there in second. Yeah, he's still there. Like, he is, like, the guy to beat every week, it almost seems like, yeah. just because you have to beat him to win because he's always in second. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you look at the overall year and compare Calvin's overall year so far to Ricky's overall the year, I mean, we're still pretty early in the year, but we're also, I mean, things are moving. Things are moving along. Yeah. Calvin's probably having himself an overall better year, fin- average finish-wise. That might not even be true. It would be, close, it'd be pretty close. But I think Ricky's having a better year because he's able yeah. to have a one Pro Tour win and one National Tour win. Right, you got to factor that. Which I think, with how much parity we're seeing, having like a... A multiple pro tour win season even if it's two or three yeah is like it's almost gonna be unheard of like that's gonna yeah. be very tough to do this yeah, year. yeah if like. you win winning i feel like the kind of the norm is gonna be like the best players in the world win like two maybe three pro tours and if you win like four pro tours in a year you just dominated like you had yeah you had awesome yourself a, a serious year like that's 
that's what it's becoming. Although I will say, like, even saying that, like, I really think the way it's shaping out this year, like, now that we're kind of hitting our stride with the season, it does seem like it's going to be really hard for anybody to beat Calvin or Ricky. <laughs> like, I wonder, I wonder what's going to happen. Like, if those guys are going to lose, like, ever this. I year. mean, it's <laughs> definitely going to be hard. But you also every weekend have Paul in contention. This weekend, I think he came in fifth, but he was up there. He was in contention, but he wasn't. You will where have he Eagle to be. coming in and out. You should have Chris Dickerson kind of coming in He's as the season goes on. He season, hasn't though. yet, but James Conrad's honestly been there more James than Conrad, other people. As I'm saying, there's still plenty of people who are capable of toppling them. Right. That it's not. I don't think we're going to see nearly as dominant of a year as we've seen in the year. Well, the my thing past. is like when you talk about like the Calvin and Ricky thing, it just seems to be like as the, the, they're getting warmed up this season, it's like. The only way, my opinion, I mean, Paul, you can throw into this mix too. He just hasn't been as consistent as them. But in my opinion, if Calvin or Ricky is on, you're not beating either of them unless you're Paul. Um, And so you got like a 50-50 shot. If one of the other is on, you're not going to beat them. And it seems like the percentage chance that neither one of them has a good weekend is getting like lower and lower as they get warmed up to where it's like, you gotta hope one of like both of them have a bad weekend because if one of them has a good weekend, they win. Like it's getting to that point. It seems like it is definitely. I still think that because Calvin Heimberg's golf and Ricky's golf, their best golf, nobody other than Paul, maybe Eagle, can beat them right now. I don't think. Yeah, but I mean that's still. I mean that's what we said at the beginning of the year. Is those four guys? I think we might have thrown Kevin Jones in there. So I'm, I'm just saying it's because that was a shock. But at the beginning of the year, things were, I feel like were a little more shaken up. But as things have, as they've gotten into their stride, I think it's those four players have always been way. the four players. Is what I'm saying. Well, we thought Dickerson was going to be in that mix too. We though. thought, yeah, he hasn't been. It hasn't been. But those four are like the obvious four. Eagle, honestly, if you look at just this year, you can't really put Eagle in that mix. No, he's not. He that year. he hasn't really blamed it on his back much. He's posted it a few times, um, but he hasn't put it out there a lot, which yeah. I respect. You know, we talked about that a little bit. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. not like he's blaming every week he's going no, out no. and he's immediately like, oh, well, my back, I'm injured, I'm injured. I'm right, injured. right. You don't see him posting that a ton, um, but that we don't know how much that plays into he's it. Having, but yeah, an okay season. Skill-wise, he's definitely up there. That's I agree right, with that. Right. Yeah, he's having an okay season. Don't get me wrong. I mean, he has a win. Like, there's a lot of good players, really good players that don't have wins yet. So, like, that's he's having a fine season. It's just, like, Eagle McMahon, I still think, is, like, maybe the most talented, like, thrower of the Frisbee. When he's at his best, like, he seems, like, ridiculously good. So, I'm just a little surprised um, how he's played this season. And I, I think it comes down to his mental game isn't quite there. I think Eagle McMahon, if he stays healthy... Like could get really dangerous as he gets into his upper twenties and gets like a, is in the game a bit more and his mental game gets stronger, he could get even more dangerous. Yeah, yeah I think if Eagle can develop like some touch, he has touch, but if he could develop like a really good like finesse type upshot game, you know what I mean? Yeah. Where he's like just as comfortable with finessey shots and like woodsy touch shots as he is with those power shots then he's going to be a real, real force to be reckoned with. Because right now, he's a force to be reckoned with without a super great Woods touch yeah. game. Admittedly, Eagle McMahon is at his best when he's throwing huge hyzers. Yeah. Like, he is, like, the best player in the world when it comes to just stretch back. And, and that goes forehand and backhand. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Both. If he can, if he, if it's a op- wide open course. That's why he won in Vegas. Yeah, it's going to be hard to, <laughs> it's going to be hard to bet against him. That's yeah. why, I mean, that's also why he's up here at Jonesboro. Mm-hmm. It was a very, like, you can make a few mistakes, and if you're crushing it out there, those mistakes won't hurt you that yeah. bad type thing. Mm-hmm. It's that type of course, and that's why he's obviously up in the mix here. Yeah. Another person that's having themselves one heck of a season, also on Dy- uh, Discmania, excuse me, is Casey White. Yeah. He put together uh, another solid tournament. I feel like we've talked about him a few different times. And what's important about this tournament is he was able to qualify for the USDGC alongside Miles Seaborn, Ben Calloway, Colton Montgomery, and Aaron Gossage. So I'm going to say his yeah, last name. Those, uh, those USDGC spots were really up for grabs. That was like interesting. I wonder, I don't know how many, I don't really know where you can keep track of how many spots are up for grabs at each event. But that, that one was five, I believe. Yeah, that one was five, but I don't know like for the future events before US. But. That's like a really fun storyline. That's like if if the tournament kind of gets out of reach, it's almost more fun to pay attention to like, oh, who's going to get a USDGC? Yeah, because going into the final days, we talked about Anybody it during the follow-up. 
there was like 15 people that could have yeah. gotten in there. Yeah. And at one point during the final round, Brody Smith was in like the second USDGC yeah, spot when he I was know. like seven down through 11. Yeah. That was like exciting thing to watch. And then obviously his round kind of fell apart for the yeah. holes 12 through, what, uh, 12 through 18. Another player that was we were looking at, obviously part of Team Foundation, is yeah. Gannon Burr. Mm-hmm. He, he had snuck up in there. And again, I think that's a very fun storyline to watch. But congrats to Casey White on that. He was also able to sneak into the top 20 in Pro Tour standings right now. Yeah, he's like kind of like a, almost a most improved player candidate right now. He's like having a, a better season than a lot of really good pros. Like you don't usually think of Casey White as like the kind of player that he's been this season. Yeah. Like he's, He's really impressing me. I didn't think he was that good. And to be honest, like he, he's proven me wrong this season. He's playing really well. So yeah, it's been a him. very, very impressive season. I mean, I would have been in the same boat as you. I mean, neither of us picked him in our preseason top 20. No, yeah. Um, but I think both of us would pick him in our midseason top 20. Yeah, good for him. He's so, I mean, yeah, well. definitely impressive stuff from him. As we move over to FPO, we had Katrina Allen winning this by eight strokes. Mm-hmm. Paige Pierce coming in second. Sarah Hokum in third. Before this event... You were on the podcast said basically if Paige doesn't win this event, it could be the first signs that she's in trouble. Yeah. Um, which she made this Instagram post. It was a little weird. Uh, basically saying the second place at Jonesboro stung. Uh, and it eventually she talked about kind of what was going on yeah. with the event. And it eventually led to her saying that she's going to be taking some time off heading to Hawaii for a reset and recharge. Uh, which this is going to make her miss two Silver Series events and a national tour event. Yeah. Um, so I think even she's kind of on this, like, mm-hmm. she might be in trouble. Well, I think she's probably making a good decision. I think taking a little breather, she can afford to do it, obviously, is a good idea. I think she probably needs to because the more, if she's going to play every weekend and is stressing out about how she needs to get back on track, like, she needs to like sit back and like think for a second, I think, and like kind of regain her like mojo. I think that's kind of what she alluded to in the post. Cause I, you know, I had mentioned the whole thing about the Jonesboro kind of being like a big deciding tournament for her. She still made it really confusing for me because I thought she was either going to win or just like blow up again. And she did neither. She came in second. So it was very confusing for me to decide. Still. But she was not, the only time she was really in it was after round one. No, which, yeah, so that makes it even almost more confusing. <laughs> it's like she didn't blow up, but she didn't play great, and she came in second. So, like, I can't decide. I think she's just playing, like, she's bad golf. I, I think, like, the whole, like, time, like, skip a few events. She mentioned, I mean, I'll give her credit. Like, she mentioned in the Instagram post, like, it seemed like she was just not practicing as much. Like, she she's kind of mentioned, like, I need to be making more putting reps and things like that. Um, so, yeah, I think it's probably for the best for her to just like get herself out of the storylines and FPO for a second, like recharge and then attack the next event. And then hopefully she'll be back to normal because like she mentioned in the post, she needed a thousand and eight golf uh, to win. And like, we know Paige Pierce is capable of that. She's just not playing well right now. And I think, yeah, I think she just lost a bit of confidence and she can gain it back like that. That's, that's the game of golf. Like, you can lose your mojo, you know, lose that swagger, and then all it takes is one good round, and all of a sudden it's right back, and you're like, oh, yeah, and you kind of rediscover yourself. So I'm not, like, I'm not closing the book on Paige Pierce. Like, I think she's probably going to win in a world title or two or three before it's all said no, and done. No, yeah, absolutely. So, like, I, it's just, it's been a very, like, interesting thing to follow, but I think the bigger storyline out of this event was how well Katrina Allen played. Yeah, I mean, I think the reason that Paige even is a storyline in these events is simply because she has built her whole brand and, like, her reputation on dominance. And never losing, yeah, yeah. It's, the same, it's a similar thing with Paul, mm-hmm. whereas as soon as either of them don't win an event or don't win a few events in a it's row, a big deal. it's a storyline, Yeah, and you see Facebook posts. Now, one thing you could talk about is, is that potentially bad for them? Because, like, let's just say that as these players keep getting better and better and they aren't dominant, let's just say that this is yeah. a trend that continues for the rest of the year, how relevant is Paige now? Right now, she's obviously very mm-hmm. relevant, but let's say this was the rest of the year. Let's say somehow she went the rest of the year without a win, Yeah, which is a crazy scenario that I don't think will happen. But let's say yeah. it did. Is Paige Pierce still relevant in that scenario simply because the storyline right now is what's going on with Paige because she's not winning. Mm-hmm. It's almost like we always expect her to win. So her coming in third or fourth is like shocking. Yeah. Because you almost in your head are like, wow, she's playing really bad. So if she continuously did that, 
Is that going to end up hurting her, you think? Well, I, don't, I mean, relevance within disc golf is pretty correlated directly to just how many fans you have. Yeah. And the thing you got to remember about sports is there's not really a huge correlation between... There's a big correlation between success and gaining fans. There's not a very big correlation between success and losing fans. Like, the Cleveland Browns football team still has fans, and they were awful for so long. Tiger Woods, when he stunk for a few years did not really lose any fans. He might not have been gaining any new ones. People were just excited to still see him. Right, so like, even though Paige Pierce may not gain a ton of fans during a bad stretch in her season, I don't think, like, everybody who's a Paige fan, like, is not really going to, like, be like, oh, I'm not a fan of Paige anymore because she's not playing well. Like, especially disc golf, which is a pretty, like, buddy-buddy, like, we love the players, like, they're our family-type community, like, no, I don't. I don't think so. And, and especially like Discraft is not going to treat her any differently, at least at this point, because you know obviously they pay her well and and they love her at Discraft. So, um, no, I mean, I, it is kind of like we've talked about. Like it's shifting to that new norm of like players not winning as much as they used to anymore, and like that's going to happen. And we haven't even had all the really good European players exactly, over yet. Yeah. So it's going to get even harder for her to, to you know get back to that kind of dominance she had, but. You also remember that the sport continues to grow. So even as she may not, um, she may not be picking up fans that from already within the sport. As fans go in, she's still considered the most popular female player, or one of them at least. So I, I don't think it's gonna have a huge, like, big impact or anything. Yeah, I definitely think you're right, though. That the bigger storyline, probably the biggest storyline, was Katrina Allen's performance, specifically her performance in round two. Now, something that I found very interesting when I was looking at this is. This is just what she's capable of. So if you look at her round one and round three were not like out of this world spectacular rounds. Round one, she shot an eight down. You had three players that shot seven down. Mm-hmm. Round three, I forget what she shot, but I think she, I don't think she was a hot round for that day. No, nah, maybe like six or seven. Yeah. Decent rounds, but that's like a normal, I feel like those were both normal Katrina Allen rounds. Yeah. Round two, she shot 12 down, which is right. seemingly, oh my word. She just popped off. What actually changed there? If you look at her stats across all three rounds, the only thing that seriously changed was her putting. Yeah. Her putting went from, I think, mid-60s, mid-70s, up to 90%. Yeah, yeah. The rest of her stats literally did not change. I think the biggest one was fairway hit went up 10%. Mm-hmm. But we were talking about this in the follow-up. That's not really that big of an improvement because right. it, it seems like it is. But if you improve 10% fairway hit, that's like one more fairway. Right. Or a fairway and a half more, something like that. So it's not like that gained her so many strokes. It was literally just her putting that separated her here. And to me, if I'm if I'm cat right now, that is a huge confidence boost to me. Cause now I've seen it. And I'm like, yeah. look, like oh, yeah. that like I just beat the entire field by overall this tournament, eight strokes. Pretty much solely because of my round two. And the only thing that changed about my game, it wasn't like I just was playing perfect. Only thing that really changed about my game was I was making my putts. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, we've always said that if Kat's putter, you know, she figures it out and gets confident in it, like she's going to be really dangerous. And it seems like it's starting to happen this year. And yeah, I mean, right now she's the player to beat for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's she's been around all season. Um, she's always up there. This is her first like dominant win, uh, at least that I know of, uh, over mm-hmm. Paige, and um, yeah, I mean it's it's definitely something that we it's been said for I feel like years now of it's just her putting it's just her putting but it's hard to believe it because you'd never see it you're like yeah well it can't just be her putting right if you look at the stats it is it's just her putting yeah like that was that was it she i still i've said it i've I've said it so many times i i legitimately believe katrina allen is the most talented thrower of the disc in the fpo field i think she's the best thrower it's just that she's not the best putter yeah and that's what holds her back and round two proved it all she did was change up her putting uh the final storyline from this was macy walker Mm -hmm. new name you might not ever heard of her uh she kind of burst onto the scene here she was able to claim uh, Throw Peak Women's Disc Golf Championship, um, which is kind of like the U.S. Women's uh, type of event, USDGC type right. of event, uh, claimed a spot alongside Kona Panis and finished fourth overall. Now, one thing we have to mention here is fourth place was still a, a decent distance off the lead. Yeah. I think she shot six down, and I believe that was like seven behind Sarah Hokum in third, nine behind Paige, 
which makes it 17 behind the win. Sure, yeah. So very impressive fourth place, yeah. but it's not like she was in there competing for the win. After right. round one, though, she was. <laughs> mm-hmm. She was seven down. She was one of the seven downs. This is her first loss of 2021, yeah. uh, which is also impressive. Um, I'm, I, I could not find information if she's planning on like touring, touring. Like if she's just kind of ready to go on the road or if this was a kind of in the area type thing. But yeah. I would imagine with a performance like this, it's got to be in the back of her mind that right. she knows what she's capable no, of. No, yeah. Looking at her like local stats, it w- seemed like she's been like just dominating her local scene, um, which is what you should do before you ever test the waters on tour. So, yeah, I don't know if she's thinking about it or not. But, yeah, after you have finishes like that, I'm, it's, I'm sure you start thinking like if you really are into disc golf, you probably start thinking huh, like maybe I could make a living off this sport. Like it probably surprises some people. Like they go out there and they're like, oh, I'm better than I thought I was. Yeah. So yeah, we might see a new name on the FPO tour soon. Yeah, it's definitely exciting to kind of see her uh, have a performance like that and hopefully something that she is able to repeat over and over kind of throughout the season. Uh, One final Jonesboro storyline did not come from the course, but came from social media, which was Brody Smith's Twitter yet again. I feel like it's been a while since we've we've got a storyline from Brody Smith's Twitter. (laughs) but. yeah. Here it is. So initially, he just put out a tweet with a screenshot of the Jonesboro payout, and his whole point was on the players' pack because all right. the players got a mug and I think a dinner. That was the players' pack, right? And he was saying, "I really wish that money would just go back into the yeah." Pot. It was like fifty five hundred dollars in the breakdown was like players' pack. allocated. It just said players' pack. Yeah. yeah. Which Jeff Spring quickly replied and stated, "Those are just donated items, and an assumed value was assigned to them." Getting rid of them wouldn't actually add to the pro purse. So, no storyline there. Problem solved, right? <laughs> Problem That's solved. it. <laughs> well, people from that post started making other comments regarding the actual payout. So, someone responded and said, they should only pay 30 in my opinion. About $7,000 more to spread out and can make first place $10,000. Every Pro Tour event should give $10,000 to first. Jeff Spring replies, PDJ policy is top 40% cash and for good reason. Purses continue to grow. That's what gets us to 10K, not redistribution. We're getting there one step at a time. The 27,500 added cash here is an achievement for the event team. Disc Golf Pro Tour purses are trending in the right direction. You know, he's right. The 27,500 added cash is a huge achievement. Um, We'll talk about the rest of it in a second. Another response said, I 100% agree that payouts need to be much more top heavy. Someone placing 29th shouldn't get $500. That seems crazy. Jeff Spring responds, tied 30th right now, shot 1027. And someone like Brian Earhart, for example, a touring pro, definitely can use the $500 payout he's earning from a great performance to keep his touring season solvent. Very difficult to come in top 30 disc golf pro tour elite series events. Before, okay, before you get into it, I just want to make one quick comment. The fact that he uses the argument of, well, 30th place shot 1027, basically saying like it's so hard to even get 30th. That's irrelevant. Like that's you complete, came in 30th. Yeah, you still came in 30th. Like you, you yeah. lost the 29 players. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like it's just harder to come in the top 29. Yeah, like that that whole like throwing the rating thing in there. I was like that is completely irrelevant. Like I understand how hard it is to play on on tour and disc golf. Like I couldn't even sniff a rating that high. But like there are guys that can and can beat that every single week. So let's not punish them because of how hard it is to come in 29th. So All right, let's do now this. Now you can go ahead. Okay. Uh, this is probably that was be ridiculous. Me, this is probably going to be me talking for a little bit, and then we'll get Trevor's <laughs> okay. input after i'm because i've got a lot of research here i think i have some notes on this got a lot of numbers here um so first i want to tackle the redistribution part okay specifically he says purses continue to grow that is what gets us to ten thousand dollars talking about ten thousand dollars going to first place not redistribution so let's look at it if we take this same purse and plug it into the payout calculator that we use for the Balfour bedford and all these events and we pay out 50 players so still 40 percent of the field the exact same added cash that they used this is the mpo purse Last cash takes home $240, okay, which that's more than what they paid to enter. Yeah. It's less yeah. than what they would get. It's, I think they got $330, if I remember correctly. Right. So, a little bit less, 90 bucks less. And first place takes home $10,105, a $4,000 increase. $4,000, that got us to $10,000 with redistribution right there. Not a single dollar more came in, and we didn't cut any players that are getting paid, simply redistributed, redistributed yeah. it. Since 30 place was the spot that Jeff Spring mm-hmm. used. Let's look at that spot specifically. In this place, with the redistribution, 30 place takes home $375 instead of $490. So he lost $120. Bucks. Now, people, I can already hear you commenting. We want to argue 30th place needs that money to tour. They need that money to tour. How dare you take that money from them? So let's look at it, right? 
So, for the people who want to argue that, we're sacrificing $120 from 30th place, but let's look deeper at this. Jeff Spring brought up Brian Earhart. So we're going to look specifically at him for this year. Year to date, he has made $2,265 from tournament earnings. These events, he's had to pay roughly $900 in entry fees. Okay, we're not going to assume that his entry fees are covered. They could be. But if you're looking at someone who's coming in 30th place regularly or around that, you know, it, it's hard to imagine a sponsorship deal is paying his entry fees. But for this, we're going to just we're going to estimate put those in. So $900 in entry fees are being taken out. This equates to him getting $341.25 a month. So let's just pause there for a second and I think we can all acknowledge that he's not living solely on this. No. He's not living solely on $341.25 a month. Nobody in his shoes is living solely on that because that wouldn't even cover your travel expenses on the road. Okay? So, this is where I think our mindset needs to shift. It's not the Pro Tour's responsibility to make sure 30th place can survive on the road. Because if it is, they're not doing a good job at it right now. Yeah. Because you, you, $341. But, let's keep looking at this, right? You also have to remember, 30th place isn't even cashing every week. Because they're, uh, someone who's in 30th place is going to spike up some weeks and spike down some weeks. So, we're going to keep with Brian Earhart. We're going to use the redistribution method. Okay, For every event that he's played this year, it's only four. I went through and did that. So... Right now, he's at $2,265 on tournament earnings. If all those earnings had redistributed to where it was more top-heavy, he would be at $2,147. He would lose $118 over the course of this year so far. Right. Once you factor in the entry fees and divide it out, that's $311.75 a month that he would be getting. So he'd be losing $30 a month so that our winners could be taking home $10,000. Right. And that is without adding a single dollar to the Pro Tour purse. That's without taking a single dollar out of the Pro Tour purse. That's what's still paying 40% of the field, and you're barely sacrificing anything, 30 bucks a month to the player coming in 30th place. Yeah. That's not making a huge difference in him being on tour or him not being on tour, sure. and we're paying the top player $10,000. I mean, I don't... I, how many more times do I have to keep saying this? Redistribution yeah. is the answer for right now if we want to give the top players the, this type of money. It right. is, is five, is four, what is it, $6,000? Is that making headlines? No. No. Is the, the purse of $27,000 added cash making headlines outside of the sport? No. no. Is someone making $10,000 winning a disc golf tournament? Possibly. Better chance. Probably. A lot better chance. When someone made $20,000, we had a lot of people talking about it, did we not? Right, yeah. So if, someone, if these players are making $10,000 winning week in and week out, that's going to do so much more for the growth. And we're not sacrificing pretty much anything. Like, I don't want to hear about 30th place because I just broke it down for you. They, this is not changing how they live on, road, on the road. 30 bucks, what is that? He's driving an RV. It's not even half a tank of gas. It's not, like, he, what is he sacrificing there? Yeah. And at some of these tournaments, he ends up making more money because now if he places higher, he's actually getting more money. So someone in his shoes who already, it's obvious, he's not living on just tournament winnings. Right, he's got to have. He has tour series discs. He's probably doing clinics. He's got tons of other income, tons of other streams of income to keep him on the road. I am sure that these players would be willing to be like, yeah, you know what? I'll sacrifice that thirty bucks because I think I'm gonna get there someday. He's not on the road to just happy to stay in thirtieth place. I think if he these is. players are if these players are fully touring <laughs> and their dream is to be a touring though. disc golfer, the majority of them think I can get in that top twenty. I can get yeah, there. Probably top 20, yeah. So then why would they not want the chance at making more money? Yeah. Because the higher you go up this leaderboard, eventually this number of you're, you're losing 30 bucks a month shifts to where now you're making hundreds of dollars more a month. Right, right. As you go up the leaderboard. I don't know. I don't know. Every time I read stuff like that, it just gets me going because yeah. if you look at it and you actually break it down and you actually do the math, then it, that's not true. Like, it's just, it's not true. Redistribution can get us there. I agree. Yeah. The purses should continue to grow. As the purses grow, though, then if the purses growing don't get us to ten thousand dollars. We're already there. Mm -hmm. We have the money to get to ten thousand dollars right now. Purses don't grow to get us to ten. The purses grow to get us to twenty. Purses grow to get us fifteen, twenty, thirty. Right. If we continuously don't redistribute this the right way as we grow, and he also at one point said, "Look at the PGA. This is the PGA. Like what I did basically almost exactly matches up with how the PGA does payout." Yeah. So I did look at the PGA, and we're not close. Yeah. Um. Well, a couple of things. So, first of all, I think I do think when he mentioned like Earhart and whoever needing like that five hundred dollars to tour, I don't think he's talking about it in the sense of he's living off of it. I think he's more saying like that might pay for his groceries for that month. Like it's part of what helps him make a living. Because if you think about it that way, three hundred dollars, you know, it does make a little bit of difference. Although well, but you're not three eleven versus three forty. 
Right. I do agree, though. I do agree that redistribution of the pot is a lot less dramatic than the Pro Tour guys make it sound. Yeah. Like, it is very slight. Like you mentioned, 30 bucks a month. Like, I think we can I think we can let that one slide. If 30 bucks a month makes or breaks you, you probably shouldn't be on the tour. Yeah, like, go go paint, find a painting job for <laughs> yeah. three hours a month, and you got right. your 30 bucks back. Or DoorDash. You could literally DoorDash for, like, three nights, and you yeah. just made it back. And you just made your 30 some. bucks back. There we go. DoorDash needs to be an official partner. We, need to, we always tour. have to remember that the Disc Golf Pro Tour, <laughs> these players are not Disc Golf Pro Tour employees. Right. I these do. players are playing in tournaments and competing. Here's, like, let me, like, try and, like, if I'm sitting in the Pro Tour's shoes, though, I, they're in a tough spot. And the reason why they're in a tough spot is because they're a young enough tour that I think they're still really trying to stay on the good side of the majority of the players. And when we talk about disc golf, like we just talked about the beginning of the show, there's about three to five guys that have a chance of winning. So they are they can't side with those guys as much as they have to side with the other 50. So like they're trying to make everybody happy, which I think is a problem with disc golf sometimes. But like I think they're just such in their such infancy right now that they're just trying to keep everybody wanting to play on the pro Here's my tour. problem, right? Is because another thing people say is you need those low spots. Maybe I'll have to do this math next week. You need yeah. those low spots to make the purses this. No, you don't. No, that's not what I'm saying. I know. I know that's not what you're I'm saying. saying but they that's want the, the They want the people. They don't. I don't think they're talking about the money in when they talk about those spots. They want the. Pl- they want the guys because disc golf is tight knit community. They want all the guys on the, on the same the, tour. But what I'm saying is, if you're trying to keep those lower, pl- first off, if you did this next week, half the players probably aren't even noticing. I, yeah, I, I okay. agree. I'm just trying to, I'm just Second, playing devil's advocate. I agree. I understand I'm just playing that. Devil's I'm, and I'm just coming right back with you. Half the players <laughs> probably aren't even noticing. And if they do, and Brian Earhart's looking at that, and he's he's not thinking, I, I mean, I can't speak for him. Yeah. Okay. But in my head, I'm not looking at it and thinking, oh my word, I might sacrifice a hundred bucks this week, but now I have the chance to win $10,000 yeah. if I win. I'll say this though too. Who's competitive on tour and is upset at that. Right. I'll say this too. Like, I do think there are a lot of complacent pros that are just cool with like trying to get around 20 to the 30th place and like just like stay alive on tour i think not too long from now maybe five years from now the pro tour can do whatever they want and if a player's like oh, i can't do this like this is so unfair at the payout there'll be just be somebody else that'll just be like well then i'll take your spot on the pro tour because the field of disc golfers that are good is just getting larger and larger so once it gets to the point where a the pro tour is the tour they've established themselves and there's just no question that they're the entity for the future and b there's such a larger pool of guys who are really good then they can do whatever they want with the payout because like i said like a guy is like well i can't afford to do this or i just don't want to do it it's not fair that'll just be somebody else will just whoop, 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 walk right into is that, that not spot. the case right now I'm not sure. I'm not well, sure because is, we see the same names on tour very consistently, and every once in a while somebody pops in. But I don't know if like the if like the 30th to 50th place just fell off the face of the earth. I don't know if 20 guys could step in and and would a be willing to do that because of how hard it is to tour, and b would be good enough. I don't know. I'm not sure. Well, you also have to remember right it's now. Tough waters. Right now, it probably would still fill from players within three hour radius. That's also true, but it's not, it's, I, the, here's another point for the pro tour is they want to have a tour because yes. they want the same names to be recognized these yes. weeks. So I think, I think what they're doing and I think what Jeff Springs is getting at, and I still think the pot should be distrib- redistributed because I think you can do that. But I think what Jeff Springs big thing is he's trying to keep the same 50 guys or whatever consistently touring to build familiarity with the tour field. And like, I, I, I kind of understand what he's going with, but like I said, I think it's just going to be a matter of the sport growing financially and like more good players coming around. Cause like right now on the PGA tour, if some dude who's consistently coming in 50th place place just said, I'm not doing this anymore. I mean, just like, look at your local, you know, there's a, there's a golfer within 50 miles of you right now who is really good at golf. Like it's, there's so many good golfers, but disc golf, it's a little harder. Like you might have a local tournament and have like two guys maybe in the pro field that are rated over a thousand you might not even have a single one you know so like i think it's just a little bit more sparse but it's quickly quickly trending upwards to where people keep getting into the game and they're like look at brody smith an athletic guy with a frisbee background he is a top 20 professional and it took him less than a year practically like so as as more guys like him decide to get into the sport guys who have athletic backgrounds who are committed to it 
that field will grow. But I, I think Springs is just trying to like, just, I'm just like still be trying careful. To figure out how if you just did this, this isn't a big announcement because right now, how people decide. I just don't think payout, he wants to rock the boat. How is it rocking the boat? How people decide payout right now? How's how do people even know? People, people. Make, if I asked you what percentage of the first. What percentage of the purse first place takes home? I mean, it's been a pretty relevant topic though. Like no one with knows. Brody tweeting out the payout scale like every week, he would tweet about it and then everybody would know. Like somebody, w- we would talk about it and then everybody would know. Like somebody will know because sports information gets out. Yeah, but I'm saying is, would there actually be enough players? And that you if, and you if know if those touring pros are scouring. They scour those payout scales. I'm sure. If next week, yeah, let's say DDO. Let's just say two weeks yeah. from now, not even on the pro tour, they did this. They redistrib- they redistributed the purse and did this this way. How many players are not playing? Not playing, absolutely zero. But there would there be some like a bit of like anger around it, a little bit of like mm, not so sure about the pro tour. Possibly, I don't think you would. Rock, I don't think you could ever rock the boat enough to legitimately like. Well, if get you players it to where striking. you were only paying out twenty five. Right, but field. I'm saying with this redistribution, I don't think it's ever going to rock the boat enough to like legitimately like these guys are gonna strike and form their own tour i think they're just a little bit scared of it that's and what i'm saying I think, what are they what but that's what i'm trying to get is what are you scared of i, I what think, yeah you're, you're scared of them still playing the tour but just not being happy with you well that's a that's a legitimate thing because they know like even what as much they, as what is what is the how you got a 60th place what are they gonna do if they're a little upset because they made you 90 just gotta weigh less. risk versus reward because okay so like risk is making maybe 30 players in our field of like a 30 players to 35 players in a field of 50 angry that's not no that's not accurate because if you're looking at it right the players who might slip down in there the 30 to 50 that is going to be mixed with local pros no, but you got to remember players that are actually even, top 15 players okay, that would be happy with this even no top 15 players even if they are okay because they're going to get more money these guys are like brothers on tour they're going to be all talking about how brian Earhart can't make a living now or trevor harbour because he lost 30 bucks a month i i'm not saying it's rational remember i agree with that point that you made about redistribution i'm just saying like this is what just they present them with the facts if someone says it be like you know look. you and i both know that people aren't a huge fan of facts these days man <laughs> i'm just saying i'm just saying i'm saying if if the pro tour if someone said something to him and they're when like look, people's we're money able to use it when you mess with people's money and they're like making fragile livings on tour even if it's a few bucks here a few bucks there they will go after you well next, what's the pro tour each other's what next. i think the like, bigger <laughs> risk is is the pro tour right now is very well established right yeah, it's pretty but well established yeah. if they're they still are young enough that if there was a tour that did it and you, every weekend the winner is getting ten thousand dollars. They could still wipe the pro tour off the face of the face of the earth right now. Yeah, but it would take bef- and I have before heard something like that from can get reputable organized. sources that the pro tour has been worried about stuff like that. Yeah, I know, but it, it, before something like that could ever get formed, I think they would they would fix them like they would fix their structure. So like, if you know it's a problem and you would fix it if it got formed, then why are we just living with it as a problem? Because I, I just don't think it's I in their minds in their minds it's just not a big enough problem yet. That's all. See, it, that's I think that that is it. one of the biggest things hindering the sport. Personally, is people will always look at when they look from the outside. They're not looking at contract numbers. They're not looking at any of that. They're mm, looking. They are at looking tournament at contract winners. numbers. They only there's only one to look at. I know, but like as you know, that's gonna that's gonna be the trend now though. They will look at contract. We'll numbers. have to see. I don't know if they'll ever. I be don't one know big because enough to look at again. Will there like, be ones that like I feel like some players would be kind of embarrassed to release their contract? Yeah, numbers that's what I'm saying. Balls. Like I don't know if how many will get released. That's what I'm saying. But right up to this point, if you're looking in, you're looking at tournament winnings, and you're saying you're not caring that whatever had thirty thousand added. You're saying that dude won a pro tour event, an elite series event, and took home. Five thousand dollars. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, you're not yeah. looking at thirtieth place to come five hundred. I think the five figure mark when you hit ten thousand, like ten thousand dollars, just sounds so much more than nine thousand dollars. Like I think the five figure mark is a little bit significant. Uh, I'd like to see it get there. I don't, I don't know. I think it's an issue from somebody within the sport who like thinks that the the guys who are winning because I'm just a big fan of win, like guys who want to win on tour and are like cutthroat and I'm a fan for like a cutthroat tour. That's yeah, why, why I, that's another thing is why are we rewarding the guys that are in thirtieth place instead of rewarding the guys that have dedicated their life to being first? That's what I'm saying. I, I I'm a fan of like cutthroat tour cards, qualification, like earn it type thing. Like basically everything the Super League didn't stand for. If you guys <laughs> ever followed that storyline, but. Um, yeah, a lot of disc golf is very much pro let's scratch everybody's back. Um, so that's why I mostly disagree with this payout structure 
is because I, I like the whole idea. Like, yeah, you got to go out and win. Like, I don't want guys on tour that are like just complacent. Like, I want guys who want to win. Um, but I don't know. I'm not as angry about it as you are, but I all, I do agree that like it. There's no reason it shouldn't be fixed. I just don't understand it. Like, it's such an easily fixable problem. And what what really bugged me is that like he literally goes. That's what gets us ten thousand, not redistribution. Redistribution gets us ten thousand. Like I can I can run the numbers ten different ways. We're there. Yeah. We're already here. Again, the money is in the sport. It's just not going to the right people. Maybe next year. And that's even that's not even just talking about redistribution. There's money. Like I don't even want to talk about half it. You think we can get enough for Battle for Bed for next year to, to get to get the ten k? I don't know. We have to raise a lot of added money. <laughs> but I can tell you one thing: with ten thousand added cash to the Battle for Bedford. The winner of Battle for Bedford will be taking home more money than some of these Pro Tour events. Yeah, it's true. Or close to it. Silver Series, probably more than most Silver Series. Yeah, yeah. And guess what? I probably won't hear a complaint. No, yeah. Because who doesn't want to show up for a chance to win that? It's a hot topic right now, man. Mm, mm. It's a hot topic. All right, it's time to cool things down. I can't get fired up while you're fired up because then things will just get loud. I, I, got, I mean, somebody has to be like the, you're right. the ice. Somebody's you're gonna right. be the fire. Because <laughs> you I know, just, I, I get fired up about that. I if mean, I, I to. just one thing about it is like since we only talk about disc golf on the show, there's only so many topics to get into, right? But when you like week after week see a topic like this get brought up and week after week see it get brushed to the side and the wrong answers get put out, <laughs> I just get more and more and more ticked off. I, yeah, I get that. Because, like, the answer is in, like, it's right in front of you. It's sitting there. I would be, I would be, like, I would pay a good bit of money to sit in on, like, pro tour board meetings and hear, like, what they talk about and see if there's just something that they know that we don't know that, which is like, oh, yeah, I didn't consider that. Or if it's just, like, no, like, there's just not making any sense. <laughs> like, I just wonder. I wonder. I mean. What it's like in there. If there was something, like, to be think a fly you- on the wall, you know. <laughs> I mean, surely they've run the numbers, and no, but I'm no, sure. actually they haven't because he says that's not what gets to Tim K, not like redistribution doesn't. If why he had ran the numbers, he would he, know that. I don't think he meant literally. Well, then why would he like, tweet it? I think that's what he meant. He meant like that's not the way we want to get to Tim. That's K. what he should have said. But I still think it's wrong. It was a tweet. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> we all just, make typos. Hmm. Oh, that's not a typo. You lose. He you spelled lo- everything right. He even had proper like comma right after 10k like he he's perfect oxford, grammar oxford comma <laughs> perfect perfect grammar in here wasn't a typo all right man trevor's trivia <laughs> can't wait to lose at this least i'll a, make 500 bucks well, this is kind of a fun little trivia's trivia's trivia that, that sounds like thing? an artificial sweetener trivia trivia that, that is no it's trivia. truly a, truly has the artificial sweetener anyways uh today's segment is called Who's taller? <laughs> <laughs> I liked like the really subtle like title. It's just who's taller. I quizzed Connor on this earlier, and I did get him on a few of these. So oh, we're just gonna, gonna it's head to head matchups. Okay. Um, might have to. This is gonna be tough. I'm gonna have to dig. Yeah. I got I got two wrong. Just let you know, Hunter. So two wrong. I gotta beat. Wanna, I gotta beat two wrong. Yeah, I think you'll probably get the same two wrong though. You think? Yeah. Well, I don't like that you just said that, but in any case. <laughs> well, there's, I mean. It's all right. It's all right. Well, he knows we'll that you're trying it. to trick him with some of them. Like, <laughs> the trivia game. All right. Oh, there's all right. two he's going to trick me with. First matchup is Paul McBeth versus Kevin Jones. Mm, Kevin Jones is taller. Yes. That was the easiest one. Kevin Jones is 5'10. Paul's 5'8. That's the one I got wrong. And then, you really got that one wrong? Mm-hmm. And then the next matchup Calvin Heimberg mm-hmm. versus Big Germ. Big Germ. Zero hesitation. How tall do you think Calvin is, by the way? He's probably like 6'3". 6'5". Oh, frick. How much is that his fro? Oh. <laughs> he used Calvin to have short hair, so like they, his measurement's probably from before then. But Big Germ's only 6'6". Six, six. It's an inch right, difference. Well, I, like, I put that in there because like when we met Calvin in real life, he's freakishly tall. Yeah, but when you meet Germ, you're like, wow. It's no wonder they call you Big Germ. he's a big dude, though. Calvin's no, but he's also stick. like... Yeah, well, you're only an inch difference in height. Well, I think it's his hair, man. I don't think so. <laughs> Anyways, next matchup, Ricky Wysocki versus James Conrad. Oh, that's a close one, but I got to go Ricky. Mm. See, it's actually not as close as you think. James Conrad's only 6'3". Ricky's, yeah, Ricky's another guy that's Ricky's tall. Ricky's 6'5". You look at him and you're like, wow. James Conrad, Conrad got that one wrong because yeah. I I also thought James Conrad was taller than 6'3". I think it's just he's really lanky and he's got the long hair. Yeah. Man, three for three so far. This might be the toughest one yet. Simon Lazat versus Will Shoestrick. 
Mm, see, now you're going with players that I haven't seen a lot. No. I've only I've only seen I've only seen Will in person once, and I've only seen Simon like twice in person. Yeah, I've only... and I've never seen them close to each other. <laughs> so that's completely irrelevant that I've even seen them in person. But I feel like Simon made me feel shorter, so I'm going Simon. Incorrect. Dang it! Simon is actually only six foot one. You'd think he's taller, but Will is six foot two. How much of that is hair? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm down. All I lost right. one of them. Last matchup is Emerson Keith versus Paige Pierce. Page has got to be taller. It's tied. That was just okay. Kind of fun. They're both five foot five. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to put that in there. Almost perfect. That Simon one was very tricky because I also thought, like, surely he's taller than six. Yeah, he one. just seems tall. When it first popped up, it said his height was measured in centimeters and it said like 6.07. And for some reason, I registered that as six foot seven. And like, I questioned my whole existence. I was like, <laughs> I was like, I know Simon <laughs> is not like guarding LeBron James. Like, <laughs> but anyways, yeah. Disc golf heights, man. I got that one wrong too. The one, the first one I told you I got wrong, I didn't actually. He's get a wrong. trickster. I was proud. Oh, of you were trying to trick me. I already disappointed Trevor so much. <laughs> well, I was gonna like when you said you got that one wrong, I was like, that was the hard one. I'm about to win all of well, these. That's I tried to get in your head a little bit because I feel like I ruined the game for Trevor. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. I, well, what two did you actually get wrong? I got uh, the Ricky and James the Ricky one, and, James and then Calvin. And then the, and no, the Will and. Simon, Will and Simon, Will and Simon. It seems like Simon it's obvious. I see. I thought if I pit Calvin versus Big Germ, you would think about it because you'd think I was trying to trick you by putting Big Germ against somebody because you'd think, oh, obviously pick Big Germ. He's the tall guy. I thought you'd think about it more. Well, and see, when you just part spat it, out Big Germ, I was like, yeah. all right, well, Well, darn, part of I'm it was idiot. I just saw like all of them at Waco. Well, it was close. And so gave I can just for, like though. in my head picture Calvin freakishly tall. How, how up did I look? Because I'm shorter than 95% of them. How up did I look? I am. I mean, I'm. I'm five ten. So, respect. Yeah, pretty man. much everyone on that list is taller than me, except for Paul and Emerson and Paige. Respect. How tall are you? You're five taller eleven. Than me. I'm only got. I'm five nine and a half. Heck yeah. Nine and a half. Let's just say we're all five ten. Can we all be five eleven? <laughs> no. Wait, what? There's some height that doesn't exist. People always say, "Is it five eleven? No, it's six foot. It, because here's here's my thing with height. No, it was, if, it was in the if fives. If a man admits he is well. Five, 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 ten, five, ten a lot is, is, is like people say they're five, ten or not five, eleven. If a man says he's five, eleven and not says he's six foot, cause he probably couldn't get away with it. He's five, eleven for sure. Well, that's why I think five, if you eleven say is you're, the height that doesn't exist. If you exist. say you're five, yeah. If you say you're five, eleven, cause people rarely do, you are probably five, eleven. Yeah. If you say you're five, ten, you're probably a little bit shorter. Although I believe you. I think technically I, I think I'm five, eleven. And if you say you're, say if you ten. say you're six foot, very unlikely yeah. <laughs> because like because like i mean if i measure myself with my shoes on i'm close to, i'm about six feet but like six foot people on the dot very rarely exist my dad might be one of the only ones that i've yeah. ever my dad seen. is my dad's six foot on the dot because like maybe like that that earlier generation they can get away with that but like in our generation if you say you're six foot like we know you're five i think <laughs> i think five eleven is the the height that people say doesn't exist yeah because people like if you're already at five eleven yeah. Why not just say you're I was, six feet tall? I was 5'10 and like a half for so long. And then like my last year, or like my first year of college, my last year of high school, I got to 5'11. See, I'm five, I think I'm like a little over 5'11 with my shoes on and 5'10 with my shoes off. Yeah. I'm about I'm like 5'12 and a half. So you're six foot and a half. <laughs> but uh I don't I don't that, <laughs> What you just said. That's a great joke. <laughs> I was, well, I don't understand like why that. people try to exaggerate their heights. Like does it doesn't make you that much cooler? I think There's people think like, it's not like the type of guy who will get, exaggerate their height is the type of guy who will think that's gotcha. cool. Though. Yeah, because it's not an a correlation. It's like I worked my well, whole it life all started, so that I could be six. It all started when it was like a TikTok trend that like women were like minimum height six. Feet. Another height that doesn't exist is six two because if you're six two, you're gonna say you're six three because six three sounds awesome. Yeah, I mean, so really, like, once you get over six foot, like who's six one? That's another height yeah, that people doesn't are exist. Six two. <laughs> Everyone just rounds up. I mean, on my on our basketball roster in high school, we were all six foot or more or taller. All of us. We, I had a five eight point guard. He was six foot. Like we'd show up and we're just like a bunch of misfits. But I mean, you can put whatever you want on your roster. So That's then when you point. look at who you're playing, it's like, oh man, dude, this whole team's <laughs> six foot and their center's six ten. <laughs> to like get there and they're relieved. Yeah, the you get there like six three and a half. If you, well, no, it's a, it causes like existential crisis because you're like, am I six foot? They now? do that for like uh, NBA draft boards. Like people's heights get, and actually, it goes both ways. Like guys will who are like um, want to play small forward. Like Kevin Durant, people say he's like almost seven feet, but he was like six nine lift listed at, on the draft because they wanted him to like 
fit his position more for the draft. Yeah. Goes both ways, man. I can't imagine being in those shoes, but anyways. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually five Steers seven. back on track. <laughs> All right. Uh, this next one isn't really a talking, like, we're not going to have much to, like, t- debate. It was just kind of announced last Wednesday after we shot the podcast that the European Open is unfortunately canceled for this year. Bummer. It's another major that has been taken by COVID. Um, after a difficult spring, this is from uh, the organizers of the event, they said in an Ultra World article, after a difficult spring full of uncertainty and much debate, the event organization came to the conclusion that the current COVID-19 situation in Finland and globally doesn't allow the event to be organized this season. The event organizers wrote in a press release, the international travel limitation, quarantines, limitations on gatherings, and other restrictions required to curb the spread of the virus have too severe of an effect on the event. Yeah. So, Bummer. the writing was kind of on the walls. Everyone was hoping this was going to happen. Yeah, it really depended but, on, like, European government decisions. Well, honestly. yeah, a second wave so, is going It wasn't in their through, hands. <laughs> yeah, another wave is going through Europe right now, which I think is kind of raised the uncertainty because it's one of those things that come time of this event in june or july right you never know it might be cool it might have been good mm-hmm. to go but you have to make that call now especially yeah. where a majority of your field is going to be coming from the u.s mm-hmm. yeah i mean we this one was probably the the major that most people were like i hope that happens but probably not going to um we only got two majors this year yeah, yeah. we'll have the usdgc and um slash throw pink the throw pink women's is replaced the women's nationals right when I was saying it earlier, I, think, I was like, well, is women pink, national still a major? Throw pink is an end of a thing still, though, the right? The throw pink women's disc golf championship. And yeah. wasn't, the, wasn't it always an end of a thing? Well, last year, it was the women national but championship. But was it still Innova? Yes, it so was the USDGC. I think it's still the same event. They just like made it like the throw pink But thing. last year, the women's national championship didn't take over U.S. women's. It, they, uh, it was just U.S. women's got canceled. Right. They added an event with, U, with USDGC. Right. Connor, can you Google this? See if uh see if U.S. Women's is happening this year. I didn't think about it until this podcast started. And we we're talking about the why, throw pink. If, why, how would it be though if they didn't have qualification spots in like any of the events? Well, U.S. Women's normally doesn't have qualification. I don't think. Oh, it's an open. I'm pretty sure. Um, because the throw pink women's disc golf championship, uh, doesn't really mention like United States in man, it at all. Need more majors with qualification. It's so cool. It is. It's it gets so, so many cool, storylines too. But yeah, because I was thinking that too, is like the Throw Pink Women's Disc Golf Championship, it doesn't have United States in it. Yeah. So it makes you think like the United States Women's is still happening. Yeah, maybe, maybe I feel the like women it's happening. Get, maybe the women get three majors. Why this do I year? feel like it's happening? No, because then Throw Pink wouldn't be a major if the women's, women's national Then why are they qualifying for it? It's not a major. Bro, you're making me question my whole existence right now. I'm <laughs> Connor, you Google the women's. I think it's taking place. <laughs> you Google like US, US women's. women's, I'm Googling Throw Pink Women's. I'm pretty sure. Oh, you said so. U.S. Women's the Throw Pink Women's Disc Golf Championship is on usdgc.com. Yes. Okay. What is look up U.S. Women's? So just U.S. Women's, not okay. Yeah. I want to see if that's happening. Uh, I'm gonna look up the Throw Pink Women's to see if it's a major. Here's this. Um, it's an X A tier. So the Throw Pink Women's Disc Golf Championship is an A tier happening in rock hill so on usdgc courses which is why it's an x8 tier which makes me think that u.s women's is happening interesting because this isn't a major it'll just happen the same time as usdgc and, you and be the the it. same event uh as oh, women's wow. national last year yeah, okay what about so i'm um, what did you what were you just do you still need anything i need the u.s women's is the u.s women's the, it says it says date is 21st of May to 23rd of May, 2021. Okay, so that's the next major. Yeah. There it is. Where is it? I think it's in California. It is in California. This is all California. coming back to me. Yeah, I definitely knew this was happening. Mm. Yeah. Orange Trail, this whole, Rockland, the whole throw peak. Auburn, California. I'm guessing there are those different cities in California? Yeah. Huh. The whole the whole throw pink in qualification just threw me for a loop yeah, because I just weird. immediately replaced U.S. women's with it in my head when okay that shouldn't happen. So yeah, the, so the U.S. so the throw pink women's disc golf championship will happen the same time as USDGC. USDGC is a major for the men's, but U.S. women's is a major for the women's division FPO. Gotcha. That's happening in May. Okay, so there are two events completely separate. One's not a major. All right, um, all right. Back on track. We're back here. All right. Final final talking point here, the Mid America Open. Uh, before we get into predictions and stuff, excuse me. One interesting thing is on Tuesday, 
The Disc Golf Pro Tour announced that they're having to move the event away from Harmony Bends due to unsafe course conditions. This comes after pretty much a freak snowstorm and a pretty poor weather forecast for the event. Uh, on their website, they said, we are disappointed, or this might have been, this is on Ulti World, I believe. Ulti World, I believe. We are disappointed that we are unable to play at Harmony Bends, one of the highest rated courses in the world, said Disc Golf Pro Tour director and CEO Jeff Springs. It's actually Jeff Spring. Why do I always add an S to the end of his name? That's irrelevant right now. We all do. Disc Golf Pro Tour director and CEO Jeff Spring. However, we knew this was a possibility and prepared to move forward if this scenario were to arise. We are happy to still be able to offer our competitors the opportunity to play a Silver Series event and earn tour, tour points. So players will now play at the back course at Albert Oakland Park. Now, I do not know anything about that course. Yeah, I don't I've know. I've never even heard of it. I'm like... It's definitely going to be interesting. High key, like pleased and impressed that the pro tour had a contingency plan and would like just like kind of rolled with the punch and smoothly acted on it yeah that's good for them yeah i mean it, all right it's definitely gonna be interesting <laughs> because so now that was announced on tuesday yeah the event starts on friday i believe so there's still plenty of time for players to learn this course it's mm -hmm. definitely gonna be interesting though like what is this course gonna look like yeah the back course it because I, I would imagine most areas I'm sure they had that course picked out yeah most areas though don't have two pro tour caliper courses right like, I guess for us, it would be What's like, it's at New course? London, and we move Albert it to Independence what? Park, which is, like, still good. But Albert, what is it? Albert Oakland Park. It's back the back course. course. It's got a 4.1 on U-Disc. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's How got, tough is it's it? It's got Mach 3 baskets. <laughs> oh, that'll be fun to watch. Well, I mean, it's a Silver Series, so I guess it's not. I mean, I'm scrolling through pictures. What's the distance it's looking like? It does. Let's yeah. Let's look at the scorecard. The pictures don't look like crazy. The main, the actual layout. Oh, 5,600 feet. That's the course. Yeah. 5,600. It's really short, and it's all par threes. That they're haspies. Oh, here it is. They have a <sighs> Mid America. Thank goodness. Okay, it's still. <laughs> hey, though, it's only 6,300 feet. It's still pretty short par four, par three heavy. Like we're talking 288, 316, 255, 320. I'm starting to feel a lot better about my pick. There's a lot of short holes and only a couple par fours. Or wait, what is there? There's one par four, and it's 458. Wow. Yikes. So they had a contingency plan, but they must not have had a lot of good options. And it is about to be birdie or die. <laughs> like, it is about to be serious birdie or die golf out there. Yeah. What's interesting, interesting too, yeah. another like kind of storyline of this is next weekend. So not this upcoming weekend. The weekend after that is the DDO. Right. The DDO starts on a Wednesday. Uh, I believe they're playing two courses. But regardless, if you play the Mid-America Open, then you're going to have to travel, get in town, you might only have like two days of practice yeah. for the DDO, which is a national tour. So there's a lot of players, Ricky, uh, Brody, I know had posted about it. Um, I forgot who else. There's a few other players though that have decided just to skip mid America and go straight to DDO to start prepping for that. So they can have a full week and a half of prep versus coming from mid America. Mm -hmm. What I think is the bigger storyline here is that Paul is not one of those players. No, he's... which is kind of weird. Cause he's almost, yeah. Prioritizing a silver series over prep for the DDO. Which maybe yeah. he's just saying, I know these courses, yeah. the DDO courses so well. I imagine his thought was like, I've played the DDO courses quite a few times in my career. Like, I don't think having that extra day of practice is really going to make a huge difference. Yeah. And like, you know, you're still, by staying in competition, you're still keeping yourself tuned up, you know, mentally, especially. So, yeah. I think well, that's the tough part now is he's going to be going from a, it seems like, seemingly a, a pitch and putt, putt yeah. to a maybe that was also his opposite. thought though he's like it won't be hard on him like it'll just kind of be an easy well little... but he didn't make the decision when it was at a pitch and putt he made the that's decision when it was at harmony bends that's also true um yeah for predictions i wrote this and now i'm pretty i have an even better feeling i said i don't know why but i have a feel pretty good feeling about dickerson this weekend and now that i know it's a short tactical wooded course i have an even better feeling about dickerson i do have paul in second I mean, looking at the field, I really wanted to pick Paul. It was kind of hard not to. Yeah. And I have Conrad coming in third, which, again, mm -hmm. I kind of feel pretty good about that now that I know yeah. it's a short technical course. Yeah. I have Paul in first, Conrad in second, and Kevin Jones in third. I'm trying to see if Kevin Jones, with a fourth place finish, I believe it was fourth place last week, gets a little momentum, and it's an easier course. Although, now that I know how short the course is, and I think putting is going to be huge, so I still love my Conrad and Paul picks. But Kevin Jones is not 
Now he makes a lot of outside the circle putts, and that could be big on a that short can, and that could be big on a short course. So we'll see. But this putters are going to be huge. So this Dickerson's be, not a bad pick. Yeah, this could be a good week. A good week to see some people like sneak in there that you're not really yeah. used to. Yeah. Uh, on the FPO side, uh, I've got. Yeah, I'm sticking with these. Heather Young taking it down. I have Sarah Hokum coming in second. She's been on a hot streak recently. Yeah. Uh, and then I have Rebecca Cox coming in third. So I got the Tennessee takedown. Chris Dickerson and Heather Young. Is Heather Young from Tennessee? Yeah, she is. I think so. Connor's fact Double checking. Check. Me. See, I think the FBO field, I mean, to, to snub Missy Gannon right there with the golf she's been playing lately is pretty ridiculous. But. I went literally with the three highest rated players because they're. I think they're pretty separated. Because you're boring. The pack. No, I think they're pretty separated from the pack. I went Hokum, yeah, Missy Gannon. Yeah. There you go. Missy Gannon in second, Heather Young in third. Because like I just don't see those three players at a short, easy course. I think their ratings being higher than the pack will prove out. See, there's a difference between you and I. I know ratings don't mean anything when it comes to how players about to play. So I go Heather Young, Sarah Hokum, Rebecca. I Cox. mean, when there's a 20 point difference between their rating. From like the third best rating to like the next, it there's a little bit there. We'll we'll see this weekend. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what about your dark horse pick? Yeah, and that's what I'm about to get into. All right, let's see. Let's hear our dark horse picks and the reasoning. We'll let Connor start. Connor, there you go. Who's your dark horse pick? Oh, tell I us why. I don't really want to start, but I will. Um, have I have you made that- your dark horse pick yet. I I had between a few different ones, and I was going to hear what you guys had to say. Oh, I really put you on the hot seat. But, you know, I I feel good about it. I'm going to go real dark horse. I'm going to get freaky, as you will. And uh, and I'm going to go with a 979 rated player. Okay. You love picking the low rated guys. I do, because it's helped me the past two weeks. What are the odds of that, though? Like, there's there's no (laughs) way that happens again. So far, 100%. There's no way. There's no way that's going to happen again. Like, no way. Okay, well, I'm going with a guy from from the area from columbia and so i am gonna go with brock roller r-o-h-l-e-r purely because he's from that area so i think he's gonna be used to the weather and now no one's used to this weather (laughs) snow in the end of april well he's used to playing in this weather though like you know he probably practices it a lot come on man and so (laughs) Grow up. <laughs> and so, so demoralizing. Uh, no one wants to hear that. Like, <laughs> Come on, man. No one wants up. to hear that. So I feel I feel good choosing him, and especially with it being on a on a smaller course, you know, it might be one. He might be part of a weekly that plays that course often. Who knows? You never know. That's actually valid. Yeah. Uh, so I also picked a local guy. He's from Kansas City, uh, and he's nine ninety four rated. And his name is John Jones because dun, I. Dun, dun. If that's John Cena. Yeah, I'm a big fan <laughs> of John Jones, the UFC Champions fighter. Team. So that's I figured. The right one. <laughs> although that John Jones is spelled J O N, not J O H N. This is J O H N, John Jones. One but more letter. If you let me down, John J-O-H-N Jones. J O H N is just a little too pretentious. What? <laughs> Do you even know this guy? No. <laughs> Anyways, well, if you let me down, if you let me down, John, I cannot lose for three weeks in a row. Like. What are the odds of that? Well, I hate to tell you guys, but I'm definitely winning. I don't know my player's location that he's from. I don't know my player's rating. Heck, I don't even know what he's been doing this year. <laughs> but I picked this guy for one name, one reason, one and name. one reason only. <laughs> and that's because of his name, Mr. Maximus Meyer. Maximus Meyer. You don't know his you rating? You can't. I have no idea. I looked at it. It's in the 980s. Okay. You can find him, Connor. Maximus. You can't lose with a name like Maximus. He might win it all. He might take down Chris. 985. 985. Great. Boom. That oh, puts me kind of on the edge of that, the rating contingency, right? What's your rated? 994. Yeah, and then 979. So if I tie with you, yeah, I win. You're right. You're picking two high rated players, man. Well, it's gonna keep all I got to do you. is beat one person. Like, I don't think it should be that difficult, and yet it's proving to be. So. All right, it's time to wrap up the show with a pretty interesting make that call, if I do say so myself. Oh, boy. Let's put you in a scenario here. Okay. So, Trevor. Yeah. Congratulations. You are playing in the United States Disc Golf Championship. How did that happen? It's your first well Who'd I have to kidnap? I'll, I'll explain I'll explain <laughs> some stuff in this scenario. Okay. You're you're on your first round and you make it to hole five. After a bomb tee shot, mm-hmm. you decide to go for the green. You can throw about eight hundred feet in the scenario. <laughs> yeah, that's about to say. On your throw, a footfall is called and seconded, and then your disc mm-hmm. ends up in the OB water. Okay, so there's a footfall on your throw. Disc ends up in the OB water. Okay. Where are you throwing from, <laughs> and what are you throwing uh, from that lie? Man, see, they've changed these rules because it used to be 
that you got a warning on your first like foot fault. Uh, that part is not super important, so I will tell you, it is a penalty right away on the first. Okay, foot which fault. I was gonna go with because I know I know they changed it. So it's more so, which one's enforced and where are you throwing from? So yeah, so this is interesting because I would my initial thought is the throw does not count; it is disqualified because of the foot fault, and you rethrow from where you did with the penalty stroke. The fact that there's you mentioned OB water. Once again, it's one of those scenarios. I'm going to be mad at the PDGA if if they like double penalize that shot for it going in the water. If you're going to say a shot doesn't count with a footfall, then it shouldn't matter where the disc ends up. So that's what I'm saying. One stroke added, you throw from the same spot. Okay, partially right. You're mainly wrong because you don't understand the footfall rule, I don't think. New footfall rule is you play from where it lies with a one stroke penalty. I did not know that was the new rule. So that's why the OB is the yeah. issue incredibly dumb rule so the new rule because that's the issue before was it was a warning and you threw from your previous spot so some players were able to get an advantage because you're saying that a footfall is like an is like an incorrect throw like a, a wrong throw then that throw should not count that's bamboozling well what happened previously the previous rule that they fixed was because this happened the at warning, I remember the warning rule. The warning. Well, yeah, that and you was threw whack. from where. So what it basically ended up happening was I believe it was an Eric Oakley with Ricky situation on hole five at USDGC, which is why I came to this. Ricky threw going for the green. He went in the water. Yeah, Eric called him on a foot fault, and someone seconded it. The foot fault happened first, meaning the throw from the water is eliminated basically he because got he got to re tee. And then he made it onto the green. And it didn't even cost him. And anything. nothing, it didn't cost right. him at all. I think the warning rule is always stupid, but I still think you should throw from where you just threw so, and like throw a correct shot. Yeah. So now, well, now that you throw from where you lot from your lie and there's OB, that's why this scenario is so interesting. So the answer is a player's first stance violation results in a penalty throw. In this case, there are multiple violations. Normally, the first violation to occur is the one that counts. In this case, that's the foot fault, though it doesn't really matter as it's one penalty throw either way. There's no rethrow, so the disc is played as OB. Since a player cannot receive penalty throws for multiple violations on a single throw, there's one penalty throw. So basically, he'd be playing from where it crossed with yeah. one penalty throw, effectively that the footfall didn't really matter. Yeah, which I guess that's okay. It all kind of works out. But here's where I think this is a problem. Let's say you're playing some like long wooded hole where like literally par is a great score on this hole, right? And you throw your first drive, and it's whatever. You're sit. You're throwing your second shot. Yeah, you throw your second shot, and you foot fault, and you throw a, a beauty of a shot. You thread the needle. It's like a one in a million type shot, and you're under the basket. And now you're tapping out for par, which you're like, hey, I foot faulted. I get away with it. That's still a great throw. And let's say your foot fault was so bad that you kind of even went to the left of your lie, and it helped you get around a tree you shouldn't have been able to get around. So therefore, you actually got an advantage and you get par, which is a great score, when you should be taking a penalty and having to throw a shot from correctly behind your lie and having to throw that really hard shot again. Do you like see what I'm saying there? I do, but I feel like in 95% of foot faults, that's too much of a penalty. Too much of a penalty. Because this could be a foot fault. This could be my disc. And I plant my foot and I just barely kick it. Nobody calls that though. It's called there's, there's like there's like golf etiquette. But that is in, still a footfall. But there's golf etiquette involved in footfall where like you only call a guy at a footfall. I have seen that when it was a clear advantage. Yes and no. There has been situations where players have called that because it is technically against the rules. Yeah, but like that's that's the game of golf. We've talked about this before. Like the game of golf will always have rules that you can call on when you're just being mean. But <laughs> like, let's just and say, but no if, point. If in your scenario. Because if if someone intentionally ran up and threw this far left, that's gross misplay. That's a whole different. Rule. No, I'm not saying I'm not saying it was intentional. Like, I'm saying like they might have been like a couple inches to where it made a difference and it was advantage. But it's not like it was like they were purposely trying to do it or anything. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying is I feel like I feel like that's too much of a punishment for mm. just a footfall because a lot of them are accidental. Pretty much all yeah, of them but are it, accidental. It's so rare though. Footfalls are really rare. Well, yeah, that's because they now you have like a full sheet of paper. That's what I'm saying. So, disc. so it's not that it's not that hard to avoid the accident, you know? Correct. So, but like, I don't, I don't. At like, the end of the I'm day, not, it I don't is problem, an accident. I don't have a problem with. It's not one, like you one messed up. It's not like you threw OB and like that mm -hmm. type of thing. I just don't have a problem with one stroke and a rethrow. I don't think it's that bad. In your scenario, the guy could take a par when he deserves a birdie because he threw a great shot and just messed up a little bit. Or now in your scenario, he's having to come all the I way don't back, think he deserved, and he might take a double bogey. No, he doesn't deserve bogey. the birdies through a good shot. He foot faulted. It's wrong. It's against. So the now rules. he gets a par. No, he shouldn't even get a par. <laughs> 
because he got a, a clear he slipped advantage. a little bit and kicked his disc? No, I'm not saying he slipped and kicked his disc. I'm saying he stepped three inches to the left. It's of the his same line. penalty. It's the same. It's the same issue. That's they, he broke the same rule in both scenarios. I, I'm just saying I don't agree with it. That's it. You're well, not going to agree with me clearly, but that's, no, that's fine. I, I think that's silly. Let the comments decide. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would be so infuriated if. Yeah, if you had if to come you broke back a rule on that, and you had to like if I, it, now, with if it a was penalty. a stroke and distance where I made a bad shot and I threw OB and I have to come back with a penalty, I can accept that because I threw a bad shot. But if it's like so, you're saying the rule, you only want to you only want to use the rules when you throw bad shots. But when you throw good shots, you don't want the rules to hurt your good shots. Anyways, that's what? gonna be it for the Grip Block <laughs> podcast today. Make sure to check out our links in social media and roast Hunter for his ridiculous comments. I don't think. Well, I'm probably gonna be roasted for the payout thing, but I'm definitely not gonna be roasted for the football thing. We'll talk to you next week.